Hello everybody, my name's Brother Nero. In this video I'm going to be talking about a subject that can be a delicate matter and it's one that I'm certainly familiar with personally, it's depression. However, I'm not just going to talk about that because that would be a little bit gloomy, wouldn't it? So I thought instead I would talk about it via the means of a good old fashioned ponage response video to our favourite gibbering Yorkshireman, Paul Joseph Watson. Now it's not exactly going to shock any of you, not enough for me to have to imagine it anyway, that Paul Joseph Watson doesn't really know much about depression. But then you could turn the things that Paul Joseph Watson doesn't know that he likes to talk confidently about into a fucking trading card series. However, on the subject of depression, it's one area where not only is he very, very wrong, he's also massively hypocritical and I think trying to hide something. But it's also one of the few subjects that when he sounds off, he gets a huge backlash from his audience. Now, if you're looking at the title of this video, you would have already known this is a response to Paul Joseph Watson, but you're probably also thinking, well, that title is clearly a bit hyperbolic and clickbaity. And no. By the end of this video, I'm going to show you, I'm going to do my best at least to try and justify that statement down there. Paul Joseph Watson has killed people, not directly, not that I know of anyway, we have to check his freezer, but I believe he is very likely indirectly responsible for multiple people's deaths. And more to the point, I don't think he gives a shit. Now, obviously, when responding to a Paul Joseph Watson video, there is, of course, one downside in regards to, you know, me, you know, you and the, audi the audience. And that is that in order for me to respond to it, I have to play clips from Paul Joseph Watson's video, which means you have to listen to and look at Paul Joseph Watson. And rather than spare you that, I thought I'd try and make it a little bit more tolerable by doing something that, if you've seen previous videos I've done on Paul Joseph Watson, you'll be familiar with this tactic of mine, where I'm just going to instead sort of try my best to make Paul Joseph Watson a little bit more obviously comical and a little bit more tolerable than he is by doing his video for him via the medium of his face, which I have animated and altered slightly, and also the voice of a stereotypical stupid Yorkshireman. So let's try our best to get through this, and I shall respond thusly. Take it away, Paul, you bastard. One in ten Americans are now on antidepressants. One in four women in their 40s and 50s are on antidepressants. The rate of antidepressant use has increased 400% over the last two decades. Why has depression become so commonplace in modern society? I'll tell you why. We're bathed in a culture that glorifies and fetishizes depression. Yeah. Now, it's really annoying that the start of this video, Paul does what he often does, you know, in which he is this close. He's almost, he's scratching on the fucking door of almost getting to getting the point and almost making a valid, reasonable fucking complaint. But as it always, he just, instead of just, you know, grabbing the handle and opening it and seeing what's behind, he decides to instead just drop his trousers and take a shit on the doorstep and set it on fire and then masturbate in it. One in ten Americans being on antidepressants, and one in ten that's the same statistics of people being homosexual. And it's interesting that Paul takes a very similar outlook to the way people, a lot of people look at homosexuality, where they look back, uh, you know, several decades ago, and remember there not being as many around as the usual, and then think, oh, there's loads now. And they assume there must be some nefarious plan. People are either being convinced they're gay, recruited, or at least, or in some way brainwashed, you know, where in fact there's a much more readily obvious answer staring you in the face, which is those people have, those people have always been around, but you just didn't fucking know it, and neither did anyone else. Maybe because mental health has, and still is, at least certainly in the course of this fucking video, uh, have, been, have been heavily stigmatised and has been something that people have been scared and afraid to talk about openly um, for fear of being seen to be a bit dangerous and a bit mental, like homosexuals, really. 
But to say we're bathed in a culture that glorifies and fetishizes it, I think is maybe a little bit over extreme. I mean, you know, I mean, don't we sort of do the same thing with people who are terminally ill with certain illnesses? You know, we have a awards for them. They get they get to make a wish and get to meet John Cena. They get you know they they go they you know we 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 put them on pedestals and talk about how brave and wonderful these kids are. Does is that is that a culture that's encouraging people to get cancer? Not really. It is now a form of virtue signalling to constantly drone on about how depressed you are. You see it all over YouTube. These snivelling hug and confess videos made by privileged millennial brats who haven't had a proper day of hardship in their entire life. They think they're being edgy when in fact they're engaging in yet another form of basic bitchery. Now, I don't like the term virtue signalling at the best of times, but this is the most bizarre use of it before, because I've never ever seen anyone attempt to try and talk about their depression or mental health issues for the purposes of seeming virtuous. There's nothing virtuous in telling people you're, 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 you're mentally ill, is there? What's, what, what, where is the virtue in this? But of course, in Paul Joseph Watson's world, you know, in the world of the alt-right in general, the concept of virtue signalling is lost because they don't have any. Because they want you to believe the only reason anyone would do anything good is so they can brag about it. Which, even if that was true, it's still them doing something fucking good, which is better than most. And I will be buggered if the side that has most people who claim some sort of racial or genetic superiority are going to talk to me about virtue signalling. I also love how he assumes that people, these people haven't done a hard day. What do you know about people? What do you know about someone from watching a YouTube video? You don't know about me, me and my life, what a hard day sh day's hardship is. Oh, I'm sorry, you've been down to mine, have you, Paul? Right. Oh, luxury, we had it tough. I always love the way Paul bangs on about millennials, forgetting, of course, he is one. And as far as a long day's hardship, well, sitting down on a sitting down and writing a load of bollocks for Alex Jones to scream at people doesn't exactly down too difficult really does it but as Paul's just demonstrated he thinks depression is someone who's just feeling a bit blue or a bit sad a bit down in the dumps having a bad day you know feeling a bit emotional that's that's not what depression is Paul right it's 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 nothing like that. you know it might seem like that to someone who you know doesn't want to admit that there's there's a problem but it, it, it's not. Right? It sometimes can be very difficult to tell the difference between someone who's depressed and someone who's just being a moody little emo attention whore, but there is a fundamental difference and the people who've got it know. Social media has created a generation of young people suffering from narcissistic personality disorder. This is another thing that Paul likes to do, where he likes to bitch and complain about social media and the effects it has had, D ignoring the fact that without social media and without being on it, he would literally be nobody. Right? You spend your life on Twitter and YouTube and all the other... You are right, a product of social media, my friend. So I don't sit there and talk about narcissistic personality disorder whilst you're sitting there telling people who are, people who are ill that they're not ill and you know this because you are the epitome, the apex of everything that's fucking wrong with what you can find on YouTube and the internet and social media. And you sit, have the gall to talk about other people being narcissistic. Now, social media can be a double-edged sword when you suffer from this, because there's some people, it's a chance for them to vent. It's some people, it's a really good outlet for them to be able to reach out to somebody when they need them, or to reach out to anybody. Some people, however, don't manage it just as well and seem to just post nothing but endless you know, you know, panic attacks they're having. You know, stuff that you sort of like look at and go, ooh, and scroll past, but you don't want to get fucking involved. It's not as simple and straightforward as that, but it's not, social media is not the cause of these things. 
Social media is merely the medium at which you are experiencing it. They try to one-up each other with depression brownie points, with endless blubber fests about their poor privileged lives. And again, he talks about people with privileged lives. Isn't it interesting how the concept of privilege, when it's applied by, say, a feminist, or you know, or by you know, a, a, a someone from Black Lives Matter, or just anyone on the left to someone like Paul Joseph Watson being a white straight male. The, you know, the, 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 the concept of privilege is laughable. It doesn't exist. It's a myth. It's just a way for people to pretend to, to play the victim card and to blame white men for everything. But when it, when it comes to depression, oh, suddenly anyone who's got depression, oh, you're all privileged. What, what the fuck do you know? Right, you you can't have it both ways, Paul. Either privilege is a thing, or it's not a fucking thing. And I know that you, I know that you contradicting yourself is not exactly a new thing. I made a video about that a couple of years ago, which I'll link below. Right, called Seven Times Paul Joseph Watson had an argument with himself. Right, he has no problem literally saying the exact top of it of something he said two and a half sentences ago, if it means he can get out of the fucking argument that he's in right now. But yeah, but don't talk about other people being privileged, especially you. You want us to think that you grew up on a train, that you grew up with no shoes on a fucking railway track, mate, right? You didn't, right? You grew up in a very nice area in Sheffield, which is a fucking, there ain't many parts of it, but you found one, right? You, you, you know, so don't give me, give me that shit. You've, been, you've done nothing but work for fucking, you know, insane butt nuts starting with David Icke, David Icke moving on to Alex Jones since you were 21 years old. You, ain't, you wouldn't know a fucking real day's fucking work if it turned around and punched you on the cock, which is as close to anyone's come to touching it. We'll get on that later. Maladjusted is now trendy, and not in a kind of Morrissey, emo, grunge-esque kind of way we've always had that okay as a guy who has to you know live his life ignoring morrissey nowadays because i you know i love the smiths and i love morrissey and i have to you know he is the white kanye and i i can understand but he says like this but he says in a morrissey grungy emo we've always said we haven't always had a morrissey grungy emo Grunge didn't exist until the early 90s, and correct me if I'm wrong, but who was the, what band was, is usually associated with kind of the big explosion of grunge? Oh yes, it's Nirvana, who the lead singer and, uh, and uh, songwriter was a guy called Kurt Cobain. Now remind me, how did, how did it end for him? How did things end for Kurt Cobain, the guy who was the front man for the band that literally sort of invented grunge? And have you seen Morrissey now? Maybe that's what, maybe that's the lesson here. Right? You either blow your brains out, right, when you're in your early 30s, or you'll grow up to be Morrissey. I'm talking about this ridiculous idea that we've been forced to swallow that constantly admitting weakness is a sign of strength. Strength of mind is a strength. They've transformed being anemic, weak-minded and easily upset into a positive personality trait. Strength of character used to be about the ability to deal with negative stuff without just falling to pieces at the first sign of distress. Now look what they've turned us into. Simpering pussies wallowing in our own misfortune whenever any tiny thing doesn't go our way. You know what, it's, it always says a lot about, uh, a, particularly a man, I think, but anyone really, who is, who is actually willing to admit that, you know, who's intimidated by this idea that admitting, you know, that appearing to show that you have flaws, say things like, you know, showing the world, these are my failings, you know, people who admit they're wrong, people who... Who, who show, you know, emotion and cry and get upset and distress. People who show that they're fucking human are the ones who... And that's called a weakness. It's not a weakness, Paul, to feel things, is it? Just because some... But sometimes, you know, Paul, being happy all the time is a weakness because that means that you can be, you know, you, you be, you're very naive and gullible. You know, it's just, you know, you don't seem to understand strength of mind. What kind of, st just because you try and resist and try and, you know, just because you are suppressing things doesn't mean that your mind is stronger. It means that you're, it's the same way that you can sit there and pretend, oh, I don't need water. 
right? I could sit there and pretend I don't need vitamins A and E, right? And as your skin falls off, you can sit there and go, I've got strength. And no, it doesn't work like that. You don't understand anything. Oh, but there shouldn't be a stigma around depression anymore. That's mean. Yes, there should. Just as there should be a stigma against smoking and obesity. Wait, Paul, wait, wait. Did you just say there should be a stigma against mental health? Do you know what stigma means? Also, you say there should be a stigma against smoking and obesity. On the first one, Paul, can I remind you that this is your is the profile picture you've had on your Twitter and many of your other accounts for years now. And also, the reason you chose that picture, because you said this on Twitter, was because apparently smoking triggers the libs. Also, apparently, you, and I cannot even begin to fathom where you were with this one, apparently sepia tones on photos trigger the libs. Right, now, that triggering you're talking about, Paul, which, by the way, no one is triggered by the fact you, that that stuff you're talking about because it triggers it that's that is them the people who would be bothered by that they're the people trying to stigmatize smoking and if you think there should be a social stigma against smoking and your reaction to people who who, who, who are pushing that stigma is to say oh, i to put a fag in your mouth and go eh, well, what would you think of that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. oh you're offended you offended are you you're offended by that you know and also, obesity, can I remind you that this guy is your boss? Hey, go on. <laughs> do you ever feel like, you know, do you ever point it out to him? So, do you go in going, all right, tubs? No, you don't, do you? So, just fuck off. Depression has become a new fat pride movement. Our culture is telling young people that depression is completely normal and should be embraced. Depression is not normal, but allowing yourself to be indoctrinated with this idea that it is is the primary reason you can't beat it. Now, if by normal, Paul, you mean it's not, it's not common, it's not the, it's not the most, it's, 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 it's something that doesn't happen to most people, it's in a minority, and therefore because it's not normal, it shouldn't be, you know, no one's being taught to embrace depression. People who are being taught to embrace and understand depression, yes, and also maybe to literally embrace people who are depressed, rather than making them go away. But it's interesting though, isn't it, that because Paul has determined that something is not normal, it therefore should be stigmatised. That's part of the way of making it, of getting rid of it, you know. And shouldn't be, you know what, Paul? Do you know what else ain't normal? By its own, by your own constant rejection. I mean, you are the guy that claims conservatism is the new punk rock. I mean, you can't sit there and claim to be punk rock and counterculture, Paul, and then start talking about, well, we shouldn't allow this, we shouldn't tolerate this because it's not normal. You ain't fucking normal. Can I remind you that this is your boss? <laughs> This coerced mental fragility also renders you completely helpless when it comes to dealing with actual tragedy and hardships. They've turned us into complete pussies because pussies are easier to push around and manipulate. In, in the, on the subject of pushing people around and manipulating them, uh, you know, bullying people, um, I find it funny that you, of all people, and and also, you know, you're the guy who you're the guy who works for Alex Jones, who's one of the biggest bullies out there when it comes to you know treating other, the way he treats other people. But this idea that because you've got depression means you can't deal with what is a true hardship? What so? What, what, I mean, give an example. You say so. Depressed people can't deal with things. They deal with depression, don't they? But the fact of the matter is that if they're doing if they're faking this for attention, then why would it bother, why would it affect them? Why would it fucking bother? Why would it bother them when something else back? Because it didn't bother. They weren't bothered in the first place. I don't even know what I'm. Resp what was the question? Logically, the depression epidemic makes no sense. I I just want to stop here. If you ever hear Paul Joseph Watson start a sentence with logically and then say that something doesn't make any sense, whatever he's talking about makes perfect sense. That should be a standard mental health sort of character trait. They should do that on like, 
in, in like insane as people in asylums for the criminally insane. Listen to this guy. Did that did that make sense to you? Right. Welcome aboard. Get the straitjacket. Cell number four, please, the one with the shit on the walls, yes. By every single objective factor, there's never been a better time to be a human being living in the West. Even amongst the poorest, our basic needs are met and exceeded. OK, by every single objective factor, there's never been a better time to be a human being living. By every... Well, there is one objective factor Paul that I think really you should you, you've kind of forgotten about and it's weird that you've forgotten about it because you literally opened your video by citing it right do you want me to say it again the start of this video you said one in ten Americans are now on antidepressants one in four women in their 40s and 50s are antidepressants the rate of antidepressants has increased 400% over the last two decades. So, that poll, if, if that, now you accept that data, you seem to think that that data and those numbers are reliable, and for the sake of this video, let's say they are. That is an objective factor. You can't ignore that, you can't state that as a, as a basis for your rant, and then claim that by every standard it is, because clearly it isn't. But I also, and I, this is the bit that pisses me off the most. You are going to sit there and talk about how good we've got it in the West? Clearly, Paul, you don't watch, I don't know, your own channel. Because here's some things that Paul Joseph Watson likes to talk about in his, in his videos. Absolute proof liberalism is a mental disorder. Why are feminists all fat and ugly? The truth about sluts and cheaters. Why modern art is absolute crap. First of all, if you're getting your art tips from Paul Joseph Watson, the new sexual Puritans. Yeah, the new sexual Puritans, who, by the way, are the same people who are in the Sluts and Cheaters video and the people who he constantly refers to as degenerates. So which is it, Paul? You can't call people degenerates and sluts and whores and, and, you know, and talk about it and, and then at the same time call them sexual puritans love is a mental illness i mean doesn't that kind of love is a mental illness it, i think you're a bit lonely modern art is still shit you know he's got loads of videos on this modern art thing i don't know why paul you just don't stop going to art galleries or maybe make some better art who knows try being creative yourself London is a shithole. London, by the way, being the place where Paul Joseph Watson lives. And he chose to live there because he's from Sheffield, which is in Yorkshire in the north. So you chose to move from Sheffield down to London, which is a shithole. But also the place where all those cosmopolitan elites live. Oh, the truth about comedy, which has obviously all also been ruined and destroyed by the left and political correctness. The war on men which presumably is being waged by women, and that would make it pretty much historically the only war that's ever been so. The, war, the truth about soy boys. Oh yeah, you were saying about the war on men, which is where you, you try and make yourself out to be, you're, yeah, you're a victim of oppression and you're a victim of this, that and the other in the same way that other minorities are. And then you make videos like that. The truth about soy boys, which literally, in which you literally say, you, you basically you know, take this group of this subset of men and you try your best to emasculate and demean and degrade and humiliate them in every single way. Pathetic. Truth about popular culture, you know, which again he doesn't like. And that's, I don't know about you, but I find the idea of having Miley Cyrus, you know, lifting her legs up and sticking her tongue out and her mouth open. I don't think that's the worst aspect of popular culture. But he seems to have a thing. He likes to put... Miley Cyrus in all of these uh, videos about popular culture. I don't know why. It's almost like if I was her, I would fucking pump up your security, Miley. Just be, just be careful. Why are young men giving up on women? Oh, I don't think it's the men. It's not them who are giving up on women, right? It's, it's like me phoning. It's like me phoning up Little Mix and you know the members of Little Mix and saying, "Sorry, girls, I know I'm just not interested. You're not. I know, no, not my type." The offer weren't there in the first place. 
stupid butt hurt millennials. Again, millennials, which again, Paul Joseph Watson is. And of course, nothing you've heard so far in the least bit sounds like butt hurt. He's made five videos on modern art. Five. Why modern architecture sucks? Oh my God, so it's popular culture, women, you know, mod art, and now architects. So buildings, art, music, the literal opposite gender, you know, people who disagree with you, people in, you know, so what else can we add to that list? Some cultures are better than others. Yes, some Yes, the guy who just sits there and just called the, the capital city of the where he lives, of the country he lives in, a, you know, a shithole, is now talking about other cultures. But for me, the one video that I that I need to show here in response, that, that, I'm just going to show you one more. And again, reminder: Paul Joseph Watson just stated that. There is, by every single objective factor that you can find, there has never been a better time to live, be a human being in the West, the collapse of Western civilization. So, yeah, that's probably the longest, that's probably the most amount of effort that's ever been, had to be put into responding to one sentence. Depression was barely even a thing. It wasn't even talked about 50 or 60 years ago. So why is everyone so depressed now when we've got it so much easier? It's because you've been completely misled about what depression actually is. Do you know what, Paul? In this country, up until 1991, rape was something that a husband legally could not actually ever do to his wife. That means from 1990 backwards in this country, a husband, a man, the woman, a woman who is married to a man could be forced to have sex against her will by that man and she could not. Now, what's that got to do with what I'm talking about? It's talking about the progression of ideas and the sort of understanding that that attitude, because think of the mentality what kind of mindset do you have to have to, 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 to set up a system where you say it's OK for a man to marry a woman and then rape her? That shows commitment. If you want to rape a woman, you've got to put in the work to get her to marry her first. Then it's OK. It's about evolving. Learning. Two things I'm sure... Your family, at least, hasn't done right, since before Hadrian's Wall was put up. Depression is nothing more than dissatisfaction with life. It's temporary unhappiness, but the dominant culture and the pharmaceutical industry figured out that they could control people and make tons of money by treating depression as a pathological disease. So now depression is not unhappiness, but a medical condition, which is the responsibility of the doctor to alleviate by medical means under the same justification that depression is a chemical imbalance, which it isn't. You know, Paul, it would be a lot easier to, and it's, you know, it's one of the few bits you touch on where there is, you know, something when you talk about the pharmaceutical industry and, and yes, but that's not, that doesn't mean that this thing doesn't happen. There are people out there, Paul, who like to fake lots of things, you know, one of my, you know, if you watched my videos last year, you'll know that um, one of my new hero, um, Bill Gibson, right, is uh, someone who made an entire fortune out of pretending she had you know, 17 different types of cancer over the course of a couple of years. She made a fortune, got exposed. Does that mean that cancer isn't fucking real anymore, Paul? Does it? Does it got anything to do with it? Also, can I remind you from another video you made? Uh, I think it was actually your now infamous soy um, video. You, you talked about, um, you, well, you said this. Consumption turning men into pussies. Soybeans contain high amounts of phytoestrogens. This reduces testosterone and lowers male sperm count. Men with high testosterone handle dramatic situations better. Low testosterone is also linked with mood swings and depression. Soy lowers testosterone and low testosterone causes depression. Really, so soy is responsible for, you know, it leads to depression. 
But depression doesn't exist, Paul. I mean, you talk of it's not it's a chemical imbalance. Well, it must be, Paul. I mean, you know, the the whole the, everything we feel is about chemical balances. Right? It's about you know changes in that everything we feel. That's the that's the cause. But that's what life is. I mean, it's chemistry, Paul. You can't sit there and toss it away. It's temporary unhappiness. Well, yes, Paul. Everything's temporary, though, isn't it? Just because something is, you know, a, a fucking migraine is temporary, isn't it? It goes away, but that doesn't mean that you don't fucking t treat it or you just go, it's near. And the thought, and on the subject, Paul, of pills, you. Paul, the guy who works for Infowars, you want to lecture other people about making money out of pills? You want to lecture anything? You want to talk about, the, you know, someone making, an in, making a lot of money by convincing people they need medication? Your medication, the one you sell being Brain Force, which, as we all know, contains the very substance, soy, that Paul Joseph Watson claims is turning men literally into into sort of so into virtue signaling signaling trans transgender SJWs who just want to break down into tears, tears because a biro leaked in their pocket and you're selling that to them so you're selling the thing that causes the problem now that wraps up Paul Joseph Watson's first video about depression now I'm going to move on to the next one but before we do I've got to tell you something this video I've got to give a shout out to this video sponsor. This video is being sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. No, it's not. I would never, I don't care if they fucking give me a million pounds or threaten to cut my fucking legs off. I will never play that game. I owe everyone who fucking, anyone who's bought that, who enjoys it, you are bringing down Western civilization. Where is your video on these people, Paul? No, they, kick, they give you money, don't they? Fuck Raid Shadow Legends. No. I'm sick of that advert, sorry. But if I can give one shout out to a sponsor, my sponsor for this video is the sponsor that's been for all of them. You, because I depend on you guys to keep me doing this shit. And let's face it, no one else is going to step up because you're the only ones here. I have a Patreon account, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I've recently revamped it, added a few new bits and pieces to it. And there's going to be some changes coming up to it. I'll make a video on that soon, talking about that. And there's going to be some more, there's going to be some exclusive content. Over the last year, I will admit, last year I lost my mojo a bit with YouTube, and I ended up doing other projects. I was a bit lacklustre. Because of that, the Patreon suffered, and I don't want to do that to you. So, my Patreon is below. You can sign up for it. Anything from $1 to, well, whatever the fuck you've got. Just throw it at me. But it's down there below. Go check it out. See what you think. Support me on Patreon. If you're one of these people who refuses to do Patreon for some bizarre reason, but you obviously do want to give me money, uh, then PayPal's down there as well. Whatever you've got, it'll be appreciated. If you haven't got anything, then click a like, share the video around, subscribe. I can't believe I did that. I feel... Now, normally when Paul Joseph Watson makes his videos, there's a, it's just like, like with any YouTube channel, I suppose, whatever he tends to talk about, his audience are there, they watch, and they tend to, and, and without wanting to generalise too much, this is just in my experience, people who are fans of Paul Joseph Watson, Alex Jones, InfoWars, that crowd, they, Info Warriors, they, you know, they're, they're, they've got the info to beat, and they're, war and they're warriors, but they haven't really got the sort of, you know, sort of, scepticism or the critical thinking or the just the general sort of like huh? to go and ask a question about it however this video that this first video that Paul Joseph Watson did in depression was one of the was you know it actually probably became more well known because of the backlash Paul got he got like the, the likes and dislikes were almost 50 50 and uh, people were literally just ripping in pieces that presumably I'm gonna guess and uh, this is relevant at some point. Generally, as with a lot of people on the right, they tend to sort of have, they only have empathy uh, when it's something they can really relate to. You know, you know, conservatives tend to be sort of solipsists when it comes to the subject of empathy or feelings. Like, you know, they, they're not saying other feelings don't exist, but they don't sort of want to do anything about it until they actually personally affect them. They're the only ones they can be sure of. But Paul Joseph Watson, being Paul Joseph Watson, a man who suffers from the tragic condition of being Paul Joseph Watson, it is both his crime and his punishment, can't, you know, he can't ever back down. He cannot ever, I mean, he will contradict himself. He will sort of like, he'll be inconsistent. He'll say one thing and then sort of say something that completely and utterly contradicts it. He just won't address it. But he won't ever admit he's wrong because he doesn't want you to sort of like 
He doesn't want you to think he's human. I mean, look at him. It's hard to believe. So what Paul did is he did what, well, he did what you expect him to do. He doubled down and he eventually brought out another video on depression. And it was called What They're Not Telling You About Depression. Now, spoiler, what they're not telling you about depression, as far as this video goes, is a load of bollocks that's got fuck all to do with depression and ain't relevant or true. But in this video, now this, the last video was just your normal Paul Joseph Watson five minute affair. This one, he amped it up a bit and this motherfucker was 22 minutes. I know, I trained for this, took some time off, had a bit of relax, had to pep up for it. You know, I had to get a fucking, you know, one of those oxygen tents. And I, I took it seriously. I thought I cannot, I don't know, I'm gonna have to do it in like two minute sections over the course of a 10 month period. If I watch it all at once, I'll literally explode. But in this video, Paul thought, right, clearly, you know, the, the last video, you know, I was still being Paul Joseph Watson, but they didn't click with it. So clearly I need to up it a bit. So he makes the video a bit longer. He, 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 he you know, goes forth with the same stuff. He doesn't go back on anything. He goes, steams forth, full steam it, balls first into the fucking bear trap, but he's got backup. He's brought someone with him, another person, someone else, another person, someone who in their circles, apparently, as I'm finding out, is a bit more well known. And therefore, you know, now he's got another person to back him up who has, who shares and agrees with his views on depression. And uh, this person uh, was Andrew Tate. Yes. That, yes, and now like, now you all know who Andrew Tate is, but for the benefit of the one or two, oh, people are out of touch, you boomers watching who don't have a, who's got, who you're sat there going, who the plonking bollard is Andrew Tate? Well, don't worry, I didn't fucking know either, I had to look this up, right? But this is the guy, Andrew Tate, he is a charming fellow, I mean, wow. This guy makes Piers Morgan look like Dwayne The Rock Johnson, right? I'm not even kidding. And I look this up and I'm thinking, well, maybe he's some kind of like online, you know, he does nutrition or something. One of those bullshit things that's like, you know, he should know something about it, but it's still a nutritionist and all that other bollocks. So, but whatever, or maybe do like the Daily Mail do where they just, they, they call one of their journalists celebrity psychologist. Like that is a thing that exists now. But no, Andrew Tate, Andrew Tate, for those of you who don't know, and uh, you're going to be impressed. I mean, he's got... He is, you know, out, he is one of the best in, you know, in the, you know, in, in modern times in his chosen field. Um, his field, however, appears to be uh, kickboxing. Yes, he's a three-time world champion kickboxer. Now, obviously, a guy who has spent uh, a great deal of his life being punched and kicked in the head by really big blokes is the kind of guy who should be just spouting off and just sounding off about what he reckons about mental illness. Any, so I thought, now, but I can't watch this without really knowing who Andrew Tate is. So I'm gonna have to look into it, and my God, there's not much out there, but what there effectively is, I'm gonna show you. So I thought I'd look up Andrew Tate. Now, the first thing I've, now I could already tell that this guy was a good kickboxer, because I've got an instinct like that, you know? I mean, I'm always good. I can look at anyone who claims to be, you know, a, you know, a participant in a certain sport. I can look at them and instinctively know, you know, especially if I've been told they've won three world championships. But I can look at them and I can tell there's something about it. And this is a picture. If you've never seen Andrew Tate, brace yourselves, right? Don't laugh. Right, this is him here. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking that picture. You know that picture of the, the inbred, you know, the black and white? Yeah. And he kind of looks, he does kind of have a look. His head is just a really weird shape. I reckon he got punched twice. I reckon some geezer went up and punched him like that, and it's like, he looks like a sort of human version of Bert from Sesame Street. But the reason I can tell that he's a, he's a bloody good kickboxer is look at those fucking ears on that guy. Look at them. And you know what? There isn't a mark on them. There's not a, there's no cauliflowering. There's no scars. There's no, not wonky broken bit, nothing. Right? And he's a, he's a world champion kickboxer. Now, if you're a kickboxer and you've got ears like that and there's not a mark on them, right? he must be amazing. I could hit those, th I could hit those things with fucking hand times behind me back blindfolded from here. If you're sat on the top deck, you could probably rest your drink on top of the cunts. Unfortunately for Andrew, kickboxing is not the thing he's most famous for. In fact, it's not even, to say he's most famous is, is ridiculous. But, uh, the, and you know he's not really that famous because 
the point where his kind of public uh, profile went up, but sort of image and perception went down, was in 2016, when he uh, appeared on Channel 5's Celebrity Big Brother. Which, as you know, is the reality TV show where a load of nobodies go into a house. It was a, basically, it was, a load of, it was a load of people you've never heard of go into a house, and then they, it's just eliminations over that. So, well, Celebrity Big Brother, you know, what it does is it takes people that you should have heard of, but ain't, and then puts them in there. And it's never going to retract. And one of the celebrities uh, on this one, which was the 2016, I mean, it's dead. I mean, they should have, Big Brother should have died ages ago. The fact it's on Channel 5 is, says, it all, says it all. And it's called Channel 5, not because it's the fifth channel, it's because that's how many viewers it gets. But Andrew Tate was in Celebrity Big Brother. And there's nothing that fills you with confidence when you're watching a celebrity-based reality TV show. When you see one of the people involved and you go, who the, who the fuck's that? Who the plonking bollards is Andrew Tate? Now, and that actually picture there that I showed you, that is him in the Big Brother chair, which he didn't get to sit in much. Because Andrew Tate went into the Big Brother house, and then, <laughs> and then within a week, within a week, he was... He was asked. He was asked to leave. He was made to leave because, and this would have been. And remember, this is pre sort of cancel culture, but not that you could cancel him. Jesus Christ, you'd have to get a fucking job first. So people started going through Andrew Tate's Twitter account because um, that's what people do nowadays. If you see someone, if you see someone who's uh, achieving a level of celebrity, the first thing to do is let's let's spend a few days ploughing through their Twitter account, find something. You know, no matter where it's from, what the context was, and we'll throw it out there, and then we'll kill their career, and yay, thank God, that's going to help people. And so, they went to, but to be fair, finding stuff on Andrew's Twitter feed that is uh, that, that is going to be offensive or going to be cancel-worthy is not exactly difficult. All you've got to do is open up your browser, and there it is, right? You can you can see it anywhere. And I'll give I'll give you an idea. This is some of the things that Andrew Tate posts on Twitter. Um, just to give you an idea, um, he's not there. He's not, I don't think he's on there anymore. And you're about to find out why. Um, they are teaching gay issues to seven-year-olds by law. <laughs> Saying capitals like judge, what do you mean teaching just to seven year olds? No one else. Just year seven, like right? when you're when you're seven, that is when you're in the area where your brain is most susceptible to, you know, because by the time you get eight years old, you start becoming a bit matched. So seven is the cut off point. Right? They teach it by law. What if? Okay, let's say it wasn't by. Let's say we lived in a stateless utopia, and there was a private school that was. You know, that was in, in, a, in a totally free market system who were of their own choice, you know, choosing to teach kids gayness. Right? Would that be, would that be OK with you? Why does it matter whether it's by law? I mean, I mean, school is kind of by law. And do you know what be teaching them about gay issues means? Gay issues is things like, you know, trying to fit in, trying to, what it means, you know, trying to adjust society, the, the, the abuse you get, the mistreatment you get, the myths, the facts, the idea. It doesn't mean going to, you know, going to, going to work with, you know, your spunk on your chin. It's not like, you know, ha you know, what if the glory hole is a bit too narrow? It's not issues like that, mate. He carries on and he uses now a phrase, a, a label for a way of describing a gay person that I've never heard in my life. A pure homosexual can not reproduce. Well, he got here somehow, didn't he? What do they do? They fuck it. Well, they they they, they reproduce asexually. They like they just maybe when one gay one dies, another one just comes out the back. Maybe that. So he thinks. Oh God, a pure homosexual. Okay, first of all, Andrew, I know that because you're this big macho straight guy who's just walking around with these but your your sperm has got a beard right it's the size of a koi carp smokes a pipe right i know it you're you're a real real man i can tell that right i can just tell that by this fact that your heads you know you, this, you know you tell you why you don't need a too big a head there ain't fucking that much in it but they put the, they kept the ears the same size you know anyway so there's no such thing as a pure homosexual because they're all filthy but also Saying they cannot reproduce, uh, everyone, I know that you think reproduction or like having kids is a, is a really sort of, you know, is, a, is an important, but it's not. Anyone can do it. 
It doesn't matter if he... I don't care how gay... He might be so gay he, like, has a magnetic effect and he's repelled off. Like, he sees women just it just in the distance, 500 yards, and vomits his brains out. I don't care. All it takes... Do, do, you, know what, do you know what you need, Andrew, to reproduce? Do you know what you need? Right? Do you know what you need? Here's what you need. Jizz. That's what it really has. Not even, not even anything to... You, know, you don't need the things that make it or the thing that it flies out of or to go through the process by that happens. You could literally just get some in your hand and just go, and it's there. You could find it on the floor. I don't know. But um, with you, I imagine, it seeps out through your pores. They cannot reproduce, so they need your children at for new partners. Yes, that is that is a well-known fact. That is what gay people have been forced to do. There's the, um, yeah, that's the So what Andrew's saying here is, what he's saying is that gay people, in order, to the, in order for them, because they... Because you can't just fucking make a new gay person, right? And you need two gay people to make a new gay person. That's just maths, right? And, but you can't do... Uh, so, this man's mind is, is quite frankly, yeah. Um, yeah, so what he's suggesting is that these gay people are going through, they're going to university, they're learning, they're getting a degree, they're doing teacher training courses, and then they're getting jobs within some form of academic institution, preferably one that deals with children who are, who are younger, under the age of 10, uh, he said, you know, at seven, the cut-off point, the gay, the sort of point of you know, gay return, right? And then these teachers are getting jobs at these schools where there are seven-year-olds, and then they are teaching them about homosexuality. In the ho and then statistically, one in ten kids is going to get, is going to end up catching it. And then, and then now that seven-year-old's gay, and now I don't know what I don't want to know what's supposed to happen next because he, I don't know whether Andrew thinks that the guy waits till the kid's grown up. Or he can't. That, what, and why do they never recruit like full-grown men? As, it's, it's, it's always this idea. It's children. It's like as if like grown-ups. Yeah, we're not gullible or susceptible to propaganda, are we? And I don't. In fact, he's just ended it with okay. Yeah, that's okay. Let's check out another, you know, magma hot take here. Uh, Andrew Tate. Every single girl will sleep with you for money. They just have different prices. Huh? Okay, so basically what he's saying is, all women are the same, you know, and uh, quite obviously Andrew has no, um, when he says single girls, that's a, a euphemism he's using, what he wants to say is slag, because he's, I don't know why he's only putting single girls in there, as if women who have actually got partners of any description uh, have never cheated on anyone, no. You know, there are, it's a buyer's market out there, and, and women are like cars, you know. There are some cars that everyone wants to drive, but they're very exclusive. You know, you have to really put a lot of work in. I mean, we're talking Ferrero Rocher. You can't just fob her off with a fucking Alexa Blue Dot. You've got to get the full screen echo, right? Basically, women are all women are slags, if you can afford it. And uh, the sad thing is, what he's saying there, that's possibly... From from the last week or so I've been finding, that's possibly the nicest thing he's ever said about women. I, actually, I'll tell a lie. There was one tweet I saw that was, uh, he was talking about a woman who had been in the news and he was actually defending her, uh, defending this woman because a lot of people were having a go at this woman. Um, do you remember there was this fad back in, uh, about, there, was this fa there was this weird little phase in 2012 and 13 of um, these people... Um, who were quite clearly um, not well, or at least extremely tired, on public transport in Britain, um, choosing to go off on some massive racist rant or, or abuse a minority. And it was all caught on film. And there was one called, it was called My Tram Experience, where this woman was going off on one, and everyone was making videos about it, and everyone was talking about it. Well, according to Andrew, the racist lady on the train is right. Fair play, he's kept it concise, he's actually capitalised the first fucking letter. And, um, yeah, that is, I mean, you... I mean, when you're... I mean, and someone, I know someone's going to try and defend, that doesn't mean that Andrew's racist. He might agree with the fact she was getting public transport, because that means she's not colluding the atmosphere. Yeah, as if this guy, as if there's anything dangerous... How would we notice if anything bad happened to Andrew after breathing in toxic fumes? So yeah, the racist. So if you're a, if you're a, if you're basically someone who's you know needs needs a carer, and you you haven't taken your lithium that morning, and you have an episode on a public or a bit of public transport, Andrew will be here to defend you. But and we've seen racism, 
we've seen misogyny. Do you know what I think? Andrew, he's a, you know, he's an athlete. He can, he can multitask. Sometimes he likes to combine his misogyny with a bit of racism. Like this tweet he sent out in 2012 about a uh, former pop star and uh, then wife of uh, black, foot black English footballer and Arsenal footballer left back Ashley Cole. Um, it, when he described her as Cheryl Cole is a massive wog socket. Um, I'll be honest, I don't... Uh, <laughs> see, that is so... That is written in such an anglicised way that I'm pretty sure that, that, that it's probably... That is the least defensive way you could say something racist ever. But what's amazing... I was like, first of all, Cheryl Cole... I mean, really? What, what has Cheryl Cole done to wind you up? I'm not racist... I hate white people and black people the same. <laughs> I fucking, oh God. The, the, the sad thing is people say that like it's clever. I hate everybody. No, you don't. No, you don't. Right? You literally wrote a tweet saying the racist lady on the train is right. And there were three things we knew about her. One, she was a lady. Two, she was on a fucking train. And three, she was racist. Also, can I just say, you've just called a woman who once dated a, and was married to a black foot, to a black man as a massive wog socket. <laughs> I mean, wog, really? What is this, 1973? What are you going to do next, right? You're going to go down the packy shop, right? Are you going to start singing There Ain't No Black in the Union Jack? Forgetting that, of course, there's also Red and Blue, which kind of throws off the whole fucking logic of that song. Andrew's most controversial moment, because, well, to be fair, it's all he has. Um, it's, it, he came in 2017, late 2017, when he, and again on Twitter, I'm sorry, if you're someone who is a sort of quasi-celebrity public figure, and the only time you appear in newspapers, magazines, or you're talked about is because of stuff you said, no one wants to interview you. You know, that's it. Controversial kickboxer and remedial level rainbow bus warrior, Andrew Tate, claims that women should take personal responsibility for their rape by Harvey Weinstein. Yes, this man looked at the heart of all the things, of all of the incidents that were happening around that period, around the sort of the Cambrian explosion of the Me Too era, of all of the ones he could have looked at and tried to sort of find an angle where he could defend the, defend the man, because he's going to have to do that. But he could have found one that was maybe a little bit more easy to do, a little bit, you know, a little bit less. No, he won't. Harvey Weinstein. I mean, you love a challenge, obviously, Andrew. But let's look at what he actually said. Full context here. Sexual harassment is disgusting and inexcusable. However, now, Andrew, quick word. When you say something is inexcusable, the following word cannot be however. Because however, saying however or but... Would, you know, would, would, would is, 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 can only be used, that, that can only happen if you're about to make an excuse. But well done though, Andrew. I'm very proud of you for having the guts, the courage to stand up in public on your Twitter account. And, you know, and stand and in the f laugh in the face of fear and public judgment as you decry sexual harassment and of w sexual harassment of women. Not, you know, I mean... Good for you, mate. You know, you, you know. So, to tell you what, they say, you know, when they say chivalry is dead. Sexual harassment is inexcusable and disgusting. However, a man looking at you, or whistling at you, or asking your name isn't harassment. Do you know what, Andrew? I'm going to go with you on this one, mate. And, however, I would also say that maybe that argument would have, or the fact you're bringing this up, this this point would carry. A, a hell of a lot more weight to it. If in fact we lived in a society or there was anything that we could point to in reality of men, um, <laughs> of men being arrested or exposed and having their lives destroyed and called harassers and rapists because they looked at a woman or because they, they asked what your name was. Right. Can you list them off for me, Andrew? Go on, mate. Just off. The I mean, if you're going to bring it up as an argument, you really should be able to list some names. Tell me all the men who have been arrested or have accused of sexual harassment for looking at someone. Right? And just tell me them off the top of your head. I know you haven't got much of one, but just do it. Oh, that's right. We can't. 
Because that doesn't exist, does it, Andrew? No, 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 it doesn't exist. So, so it's kind of irrelevant, really, isn't it, mate? In fact, if you look at the thing, the funny thing, the, in, the interesting thing about the whole Me Too thing is the majority of men who were publicly accused actually turned out to be, it, it turned out to be guilty. And in fact, in many cases, it turned out to be a hell of a lot worse than we thought. So, yeah, what the fuck are you talking about? Now, believe it or not, None of the stuff I've mentioned was the reason that Andrew Tate was kicked out of Celebrity Big Brother. The reason he got kicked out was because a video leaked that some people found quite disturbing. It was leaked to The Sun. Uh, I don't know who leaked it, um, but it was a videotape that showed him uh, holding, you know, holding down a woman by her throat and whipping her with a belt whilst calling her a, a cheating, dirty slag or whatever. I'm not going to play the video for you, obviously, but I can show you a slightly censored uh, still from it. And uh, now Andrew's response. Now, now this was the uh, this was the thing that really sort of uh, uh, done him in. None of the st other stuff before. And uh, when he came out, he was you know he was trying to. to and and I'll, I'm going to be honest. We'll hear him out, right? Let's just hear. This was his. Uh, p this was his take on it. This was him on Twitter explaining uh, what the video comes from. He goes, the video is from 2012 and they cut out all the all the laughing out, LOL. She didn't, she didn't sell it. I'm still great friends with her. We will release a new vid. Can't wait for that one. And, uh, and, and he did actually uh, pose with a picture of the woman. This is the woman there. Although I am just questioning like, you know, who else had a copy of this video? There could have only been presumably two people. Um, I have never hurt a girl in my life. And this is a total lie trying to make me look bad. And Laura put a belt on Marco and didn't get kicked. I have no idea what that last sentence means. I'm not a violent man. Kinky, yes. Violent, no. With all due respect, mate, you're a fucking kickboxer. That's kind of your job. So you are a violent man. Whether you're doing it for a job... Right. Or well, it, it's kind of irrelevant. Right. And also, you know, but, you know, I actually do believe Andrew on this. I do believe that this was some role playing um, because, you know, it's so, that, that it's so weird that you would film and record something like this that wasn't uh, role play. But I do have to say, Andrew, you know. Let's, you know, I'm not, I'm not defending, right, the, the, the idea that The Sun would take this video out of context to portray you as a man who beats women is, is wrong. However, don't you need to take some personal responsibility for this, Andrew? I mean, isn't this kind of, you know, isn't this kind of the tabloids being the tabloids, you know? And, and to be fair, don't you think it's, it, it, it was, it, this video in particular, could come back and bite you on the ass, you know. I'm going to record me choking a woman, hitting her with a belt, and calling her, a ch accusing her of cheating on me. Can you not see how maybe that could have possibly been taken out of context? But no, you filmed it and you let it get fucking leaked out, right? And and now you, but now you're refusing to take responsibility for it, right? It, it's quite frankly, it's it's dangerous, you know. The real victims here are the Sun newspaper. Now I've gone a little bit off track here, but basically everything I've just told you, this guy, that's that is all you'll ever find about Andrew Tate is all of the he's done nothing but hor said horrific dumb fucking shit and beaten a woman with a belt and 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 it, and been kicked out of Celebrity Big Brother after a week because of his great plan. This is all you'll find, and I want to go back and let's go back to the original. Now we've established who this is, I want you to think, this is the guy Paul Joseph Watson thought would be a great backup in his, in his second video arguing that, that depression is not, it doesn't exist. That this, that, that this, the depression is not a real thing. He thought this, I mean, if this was the best you could do, Paul, this guy... Who had to cancel was Jimmy Savile fucking new? Is this after he died? How the fucking hell did you think this was the geezer who would lend credibility to your fucking video? And I don't need to go through it because, again, just like the last one, this one received a wholly negative response. But he did do a video not that long ago that I feel really shows where Paul Joseph's mindset really is with this. See, a little over a month ago, Paul Joseph Watson released this video called The Truth About Suicide, which 
is just really, you know, I'm not going to go through it, um, which is, but it's basically him going through, it's basically him talking about the rate of suicide amongst uh, men and how it is disproportionately higher amongst men than it is women. And he's using this to kind of, you know, to, to sort of like, to jump on top of this and as if to say that, you know, this is this shows this this confirms all of his other stuff he was saying about you know the war on men and that it's you know there's a the, you know men are being victimised and and I'm sorry Paul but again like with like with like with everything like with the soy thing but this is much more serious right you can't have it both ways now not everybody not everyone who is depressed or suffers from a mental illness. You know, you, know, you know, tries to or successfully commit suicide, right? But the majority of people who commit suicide, Paul, do suffer from, are suffering from some kind of mental illness at the time, right? And depression is one of the big key, fa one of the bigger key factors. In fact, when you look at the suicide rates, it's kind of interesting, isn't it? That you want to sit there and use this to try and make yourself look like the victim. But what I would say to you, Paul, is can't you just turn around to these people who are suicidal and tell them to man up? Just to you know, stop being such a bunch of pussies. Although manning up might not be the right thing to do during suicide because for every, t for every one woman who tries to commit suicide, two men try and commit suicide. And for every woman who succeeds, right, three and a half men succeed. So if anything, Paul, manning up might be the worst thing you could tell someone. And this is the problem, Paul, because when you look at the millions and millions of people who watch your videos and the visceral negative response that your fucking de videos on de denying depression get, it suggests to me there's an extremely large segment of your fucking audience who would actually fit the bill of people who probably do suffer from depression, people who feel excluded from society, and they definitely, the majority of them, fit the bill of being young men. So what do you think, Paul, it does to those people when you make videos calling them nothing but a bunch of pussies and denying that the pain they're going through is actually real? To the point where you're trying to get you go you try and get a misogynistic fucking you know wife beating fantas sexual fantasist on who's happens to be a kickboxing champion, you get him on here who thinks gay people are being kids are being taught how to be gay at school. You think that guy? Yeah, that sounds like someone who's fucking that sounds like a guy who's fucking switched on. He sounds happy, as do you. You cannot deny people suffering and then dr and then fucking sit there and hump the corpses of the people who have fallen by the wayside because of people like you who deny that their pain is real. It's fucking sick. And to those people who watch Paul Joseph Watson still and you saw those videos and you're someone who goes through that. This is what he thinks of you. This is the contempt that he has for you. He will fucking happily take you, if you were to fucking off yourself, because the depression got too much for you, he would happily take that statistic and use it to blame, to, pl pl to make out that he's the fucking victim of society without realising that he was part of the problem that pushed you over the edge. That's what he thinks of you and you don't need to stand for it. No one should. Brother Neuro, good night, may God be less. And remember, where there's no sense... There's no feeling.